Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the public lecture for the International Day of Mathematics. <clears throat> My name is Francesco Petruccione. I'm the, the interim director of, of, of NITEX. <clears throat> Today is not only the International Day of Mathematics, also the birthday of Albert Einstein. <laughs> so we have double celebration. Yeah. And, and we are very fortunate to have Professor Zurab uh, Janelice with us this afternoon. Uh, Zurab is a professor of mathematics at Stellenbosch University, and he's also the president of the South African Mathematical Society. He's a NITEX uh, associate. He's one of the PIs of one of our research programs on mathematical structures, <clears throat> and he is a very uh, engaged uh, divulgator of uh, of mathematics and and surroundings. Yeah. <clears throat> so you are here to listen to him, not to me. So Zurab, you are most and welcome to uh, to start. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francesco. Um, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to give this talk. It's a great honor. Thank you everyone for coming. It's a great honor to have you here. I would like to uh, say a few things about mathematics. Um, but I will try to not to say the usual things that you might have heard many times. Before I begin, um, after having thanked Nithex, I would also mention the, um, that the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development um, celebrations. Uh, this, uh, this talk is part of that program. And I would also like to um, promote Visarco, a mathematics slash science magazine, and SEMS, South African Mathematical Society. If you're, a math if you're a mathematician, if you consider yourself to be a mathematician, then you should absolutely join the society. The talk will have two parts. In the first part, we're going to do some reflection. In the second part, uh, we're going to do some discussion. The reflection we're going to do will be on three aspects of mathematics, emergence, subject, and essence. And I'm going to say many things that uh, can be subject of long debates. And I hope to inspire you uh, for such debates after, afterwards when we have a discussion. So the first one is emergence. Well, one of the things I did for this talk is to collect quotes that I could find on the internet uh, from mathematicians and other scientists that were close at heart to mathematics. I would like to begin with, with these quotes um, because they fall nicely under the theme of emergence of mathematics. Catherine Johnson, who was um, doing a lot of computations for space missions uh, for NASA, she said that some things will drop out of the public eye and go away but there will always be science, engineering, and technology, and there will always, always be mathematics. And then uh, Shakuntala Devi, who is a mental calculator, someone who is able to do large calculations, uh, any calculating device except the mind, said that without mathematics, there's nothing you can do. Everything around you is mathematics. So how does mathematics emerge? Well, let's ask uh, this gentleman over here sitting under the tree. You might recognize him, Isaac Newton. So a tree that was falling, and then he thought, why does it fall? Um, so he made an observation and he wanted to explain it. And then he developed theory of gravitation to potentially explain that, to explain an apple falling from the tree. So we get this diagram where on the left side, we've got the mathematics that was emerged and on the right side we have the original um, part of, of, of real life that inspired the left-hand side and also to which the left-hand side is applicable. And then uh, this chase after uh, ideas and explanations goes on. Uh, I've included some um, very, very inaccurate snapshot of, of the world of a lot of things to be put here. This is just very, very few of them. I want to take this opportunity to promote um, a book, book friend, Bob Koeke, that Bruce knows quite well, uh, called Quantum Book. I think sometimes the microphone goes away. Um, can you hear me? 
So in this book, he tries to do very rigorous mathematics that's largely derived from category theory and explain it in purely pictorial ways so that anyone not having the technical mathematical language can still understand. And then he tells us that it's uh, quite useful for quantum technology. Um, uh, look forward to getting that book to learning more about it. But so the story is that each, each of these bubbles is, is a mathematical theory or, or a, a place where it applies. And then uh, you observe things and you ask questions and you want to explain phenomenon. And then you end up in another bubble that's applicable to the first one. And you build this way the whole world of mathematics. So I would like to summarize this by saying that mathematics emerges as a result of observation. The next topic, subject. So what does mathematics study? What happens in each of these bubbles? Do we study numbers? Do we study shape? Do we study space? Do we study function? I would like to make a controversial claim that we don't do any of these. Instead, what we study is deductive reasoning. The one thing that's common to all these bubbles uh, is that we have a certain set of assumptions and we want to derive some conclusions from that. And in the process, mathematics is born. It is a sequence of explanations how you can get to those conclusions from the assumptions you started with. Let's look at an example of this. Jane paid 100 rands and five cents, including 15% bet. And uh, we don't even know what the original price was. We actually want to determine the price. The answer is given there on the right hand side, but let's pretend we don't know the answer yet. So to determine, we want to engage in uh, the deductive reasoning I, I mentioned. Step one, price with that is given to be 100.05. Uh, There's a mistake on the first line. Apologies for that. It should be 100.05. First, it was and then the numbers didn't work out nice, and I changed it slightly. So <laughs> forgot to change that line. Two, now we introduce a variable, uh, a short uh, notation for VATless cost, which is the, the value we want to determine. Call it A. And then the usual thing, right? So 100.05 will equal A plus the VAT, which is 15%. So how do you calculate 15% of something? You divide by 100, you multiply by 15, right? So that's step three. Then in step four and five and six, we engage in arithmetic operations that uh, for many of us is very standard thing. That is still, it's still worth noting that um, th these arithmetic operations actually work. Um, and um, we want to check at some point they work so that we can, you can use it all the time. So in step four, what we do, for example, is we swap from first dividing by 100 and multiplying by 15 by first taking 15 and multiplying that by 100 and then multiplying A with that. And this is not a, so, such an easy concept. Um, when children at school learn to multiply, divide, work with fractions, they don't really understand why these two things <laughs> naturally end up being the same value. And then we take the A out, right? So it's times one, 15 over 100. We think of A as A times one in step four and in step we can carry that A out. Then we can add 1 and 15 on, over 100 by usual uh, rules of how we add fractions. We think of 1 as 100 over 100, so we end up with 115 over 100. Then we can uh, divide 115 by 100. We get 23 over 20. It's not difficult because 5 is in both numbers in a nice way. Um, and then we carry things on the other side. We eventually find the value for A. We do some more arithmetic and we get in step nine that is 87. And then in our, con our conclusion in step 10 is that 80 must then be the VAT less cost. And I think we have some trouble with the microphone again. Okay, so I hope everybody agrees with this uh, deductive reasoning and with the answer we, we get as a result. You might think that, okay, so this is something very simple. Why do we even talk about this? But there's actually a very intricate structure of deductive reasoning that takes place here, and I want to show that to you. 
Now, before I show you the structure, I want to do something else. I want to abstract this uh, fragment of reasoning. Did it really matter that um, the initial price was 100.05? It didn't matter. It could have been any other number. Did it really matter that VAT was 15% exactly? It could have been any other number as well. The logic that follows, the, the, the logic that these steps follow are independent of the actual values of those numbers. So we can abstract this um, sequence of uh, reasoning into what you see on the right hand side, where in step zero, so we introduce step zero, these steps are aligned with the previous uh, version. So you can follow them in accordance to what we did in the previous case. In step zero, we introduce a V for VAT, no longer uh, 15, it's some value V. In step one, uh, we set the price uh, with VAT to be B, that corresponds to, uh, in the previous case, B was uh, 100.05. And then we follow the same rules, except that we can't perform because in step seven, what was to simplify what to compute, right? So in step six, six we get uh, 100 plus V over 100. Um, and some brackets are missing there. Apologies for that. Uh, and because we don't know what V is, we can't simplify that further. So we don't have step seven. We still have step, step eight, but we don't have step nine because again, we can't simplify further. But there is something else we're doing on the right-hand side, which we didn't on the left-hand side. Namely, we're identing some of these lines. Why are we doing that? Well, we want our final conclusion to be independent of any assumptions. In step zero, we introduce some assumption, and we want to kind of make sure each assumption is like very well, argument does not depend on any assumptions. It's universal truth independent of any assumptions. So in, in, in mathematical thing, um, we have this idea of the assumptions as we go along when we don't need them anymore. And that's the presentation. So every time I, I indent less, I'm stepping out from an assumption in it. Uh, following slide. So in step two, we have an assumption that A represents the VAT less cost. And we arrive to the conclusion that uh, that A equals to, to that value that you see in step seven. But now, once we establish this, we don't need A anymore. So when we move to step eight, we're going to get rid of the assumption in step two. So we are stepping out from that block. And we have that VAT less cost is whatever is, it, it, it's written there in step eight. But remember, that one was also dependent on a variable that was introduced in step zero, which we don't need anymore. Um, in step nine, where we summarize the universal fact that if B equals VAT and B is the price with VAT, then VAT less cost will be whatever you see there. If you think about this, I'm going to. Very fixed. Okay, maybe it's just an illusion. Okay, thanks. One, two, three, four. Great, very much. Okay. So this structure of of reasoning that you see here. Um, it's full of them, but full of it, but we don't make it explicit because my
maybe uh, yeah okay I'll, I'll try to use that hello okay okay so let's start over um that was an unsuccessful joke so um some more quotes to to back up what we observed in in the previous discussion mathematics is the music of reason james joseph sylvester he worked in matrix theory invariant theory number theory and combinatorics it is impossible to be a mathematician without being a poet in soul sofia kovalevskaya analysis partial differential equations mechanics and uh Albert Einstein, happy birthday. Pure mathematics is, in its way, the poetry of logical ideas. You see, there's a lot of emphasis in these quotes about the fact that um, mathematics kind of looks like poetry a little bit, like even the structure looks like some kind of, each of these blocks seem kind of verses, right? Except that we have verses nested into each other. The conclusion from this reflection is that the subject of mathematics is reasoning. And depending on what we reason about, that's how we end up distinguishing between different fields of mathematics, probably. Sometimes it can be numbers, sometimes it can be logic itself, sometimes it can be other entities, space, shape, and so on. Now, what about the essence? What is the essence of mathematics? So these are things I'm telling you today, there's not universal truth, it's just my personal uh, point of view. Okay, well, um, Bertrand Russell uh, tells us that the, that the pure mathematician, like the musician, is a free creator of his world of ordered beauty. And we see again comparison with music here. Richard Courant tells us that mathematics is an expression of the human mind, reflects the active will, the contemplative reason, and the desire for aesthetic perfection. What I would like to draw your attention to in these quotes is beauty and aesthetic perfection. Let's look at another example of deductive reasoning. This one is going to be less useful than the other one. I mean, the other one is very useful when you want to know the, the original price without the VAT and so on. This one doesn't have uh, any applications in the supermarket. Um, Jack respects all and only those humans who do not have self-respect. So imagine there is such a person called Jack who is uh, who felt poor, poor people not having self-respect, let me respect all of them, and then just to not to run out of his capacity, he decided to respect just those. It will turn out by deductive reasoning that Jack, if such a person exists, cannot be human. Let's see. Step one, so this is our initial assumption. We assume that Jack respects all and only those humans who do not have self-respect. And we want to prove that Jack cannot be human. And we're going to use a proof technique in mathematics that's called proof by contradiction. We're going to assume that Jack is human and then derive a contradiction from it, hence implying that Jack cannot be human. So in step two, we assume that Jack is human and notice how we are going inside in the indent. And the reason for that is because now we have employed a second assumption. So when we want to step out from the second assumption, we can still stay under the first one. Okay, so let's investigate what happens in the case when Jack is human. Step three, a third assumption. Well, that one comes out of nowhere. How do I know that I need to now assume that? One of my students um, a few years ago called such a step in mathematics an intuition step, when you need to think up something that is gonna work, but there's no evidence in the beginning it would work. So there's a hunch telling you, let me try and, and, and see what happens. So if we assume that Jack has self-respect, well, I mean, Jack, if, if he's human, right? Either he will have self-respect or not, right? So if he has self-respect, then what's the conclusion from that? In step four, we say, then that Jack must respect himself because that's what self-respect is, right? But remember that 
we also assume Jack is human. So Jack is a self-respecting human, right? And remember that Jack only respects those who are not self-respecting, right? That was our assumption in step one. Jack only respects those who are not self-respecting. So Jack cannot really respect himself, right? Because he ended up being a self-respecting human in step four. And by step one, uh, Jack shouldn't respect such a person. So in step five, we come to the conclusion that Jack cannot respect himself. But that contradicts step three, because we did say that, that Jack has self-respect as an assumption in step three. So our assumption in step three could, must have been wrong. We arrived at contradiction in step six. So when we step out of that block that begins at step three and ends with step six, we can conclude that after all, Jack does not have self-respect because assuming that he does, we arrive to a contradiction. But wait a second, if Jack doesn't have self-respect, being a human, isn't that exactly the criteria by which Jack decided to respect people? In step one, we said that Jack respects all and only those humans who do not have self-respect. So who are humans and do not have self-respect. So if now our conclusion is that Jack doesn't have self-respect, being a human, that's an assumption in step two, would imply that Jack after all must respect himself. And that's again a contradiction, right? Because in step seven, we said Jack doesn't have self-respect. In step eight, we are saying he does. So it's a contradiction. And that contradicts to the assumption in, in step two that Jack is human. And when we step out from that assumption, we conclude, aha, uh -huh. so we, we found the contradiction, therefore Jack cannot be human. So we proved our theorem. And if I want to um, go from, from this uh, line of thought where our final step 10 did rely on an assumption, and I want to get rid of that assumption, I have to step out from this block one more time, and that's how we end up with step 11, that now summarizes what we did throughout from steps one to 10. If Jack respects all and only those humans who do not have self-respect, then Jack cannot be human. What about abstracting this one? So remember when we were um, computing uh, the VAT free cost, we, we thought that the actual value of the VAT doesn't, ma doesn't matter. Uh, the, pay, uh, the, the price paid by Jane didn't matter. Um, what, what about this here? What doesn't matter here? Would you like to um, suggest anything? Where can we do the abstraction here? Does it matter, for example, that the person we're talking about is called Jack? Does it? No. Does it matter that we're talking about the respect relationship? Could, have, could we have substituted in, in the place of respect? Could have been something else like maybe um, appreciates or loves or hates and so on. And there are in fact few parameters where we could do abstraction. And let's look at that here. So these parameters are uh, colored. Jack is one parameter where we could perform abstraction. It could have been any other entity instead of Jack. Respect and is another parameter, but respect is tied with self-respect. So if we are changing respect with something else, then we should also change self-respect accordingly, right? Self-respect would, I mean, if respect means, let's say, um, is friends with, then self-respect would be is friends with themselves. And then the third parameter that we could abstract on is humans. It didn't really matter that we were talking about humans here. And this is just a, a copy of the previous proof to confirm that if we do change these parameters, the logic still flows. And as a result, we get a more general theorem. So the first theorem written there in the slide is uh, the one we proved. The second one is a very general theorem where all these parameters have been abstracted. So instead of Jack, we now have an entity. And instead of respect, we have some relationship. Uh, instead of being human, we have uh, a certain type of entities we, we might want to consider. And this could be any, any type of entities. And then self-respect means that something is in that relation to themselves. Um, and being human is being of given type. So now we have a theorem which states, if an entity is in a relation with all and only those entities of a given type that are not in that relation to themselves, 
then it itself cannot be of the given type. And it sounds very abstract. Well, I mean, that was our intention, right? To abstract it, so no wonder it sounds abstract. But um, there is no use of abstraction if we cannot specialize to other examples. And when we specialize to other examples, maybe that's where we start seeing the beauty of what we did. Here is another example, which is a more standard one. So the Jack respecting uh, all those who do not have self-respect, that's just was made up while preparing this talk. The standard uh, version of this story is a barber that shaves those and only those men who do not shave themselves. And the conclusion is that barber cannot be a man. Here is another variation, uh, a manicurist who manicures all and only those women who do not manicure themselves cannot be a woman. The third one is a theorem that actually has a very important use in a subject of mathematics called set theory. The collection of all sets that are not elements of themselves is not a set. You see, the logical structure of this is very similar to the logical structure of the theorem about Jack. It has the same proof. Why is this important in, in, uh, in set theory? Well, set theory is a field of mathematics that tries to unify all of mathematics by saying that everything that you ever want to study in mathematics can be seen to be a set. So it's just all sets around us. Um, what are those sets made out of? They're made out of other sets. And if I go deeper and deeper and deeper, eventually I get to the empty set and empty set is made out of nothing. And that's okay because um, surely you will agree that there are no elephants in this room, right? And despite of there being no elephants in this room, still we are able to create a thought of there being no elephants in this room. So we created something out of nothing. So set theory begins with nothing. It creates the set of that nothing. That's the something it creates. And then you can create a set of that and set of that and so on. And you go out building all of mathematics. Okay, how can we create sets? Can we just create sets randomly? Like uh, I can take the set of uh, all the planets that have uh, pink eyebrows. Can I do something like that? Um, and it turns out you can't. Um, and the reason why you can't is exactly the theorem we proved. If you now try to take all those sets that are not inside themselves, that collection turns out cannot be a set. Whatever you meant by sets before, that collection can't be a set. That's what the theorem says. So you have to be careful when creating sets. And in the beginning, when people started creating these sets, they were not careful. And then people realized, other people realized that, oh, wait a second, there's a paradox. Um, so it was a very important step in the development of set theory, that theorem there, which then uh, urged to put axioms on the realm of sets, which basically tell us which collections of sets are allowed to be sets. Uh, and nobody has found any contradiction since then, uh, but we don't have a proof that there is no contradiction. So if you would like to find a contradiction, go ahead. You'll become one of the famous mathematicians of this century. There is no number that is strictly bigger than every number. This is also an example of the previous one, but it's, it's a little bit delicate to see why this is an example of the previous one. So. Let's take the strictly bigger relationship now instead of the respects relationship. Then what are the self-respecting entities? These are things that are strictly bigger than, than themselves, right? Um, but uh, sorry, what are, yeah, but what are those that do not have that self-respecting property so that those entities that are not strictly bigger than themselves, right? Well, nothing is strictly bigger than, than itself. Strictly bigger means like strictly bigger without equal sign there. So two is not strictly bigger than two, two is equal to two. Two is bigger or equal to two, but not strictly bigger than two. So there is everything, everything, every number is going to um, not be strictly bigger than itself, right? And then uh, we, we are saying that there is no number that is strictly bigger than every number that's not strictly bigger than itself. In other words, every number, because every number is such. So we're saying there is no number that is strictly bigger than every number. And that can also be derived as a special case of the previous argument. Of course, because this is a simpler case, it also has a direct proof. But clearly there cannot exist a number that's strictly bigger than every number because if such a number existed, it would be strictly bigger than itself. And that's not possible. 
right? So this is a simpler version of the argument we, we saw earlier. Um, now, unlike the previous example, this theorem does not have any, uh, well, at least none that I know, any, any practical applications in real life. But for mathematicians, something like this is regarded to be very, very beautiful. It's because of the generality of the argument that has all different examples, especially the significant examples um, like in set theory. So the summary of, of all of this is that the essence of mathematics is beauty. And if, if you take all of these statements I made, all the claims I made in isolation, that'll be nonsense, but they have to be read together. So it's the essence of mathematics is beauty under the agreement that the subject of mathematics is reasoning. So it's the beauty of reasoning. Okay, so this brings us to the, uh, to the chart we see here where we've got these three, um, three worlds, three techniques we employ in mathematics. Observation, which um, gives rise to new mathematics then observe something, we want to reason about it, we want to explain it, and we end in, in this process of studying the reasoning that can explain things and then abstracting some of that reasoning and so on. And in that process, a mathematician seeks beauty. Because remember, although the real life application might have been the, the trigger for the observation, the re real life application is not the goal of a at least a pure mathematician. The goal is beauty. And what is remarkable um, about the subject of mathematics is that when you pursue beauty in reasoning, you end up discovering things that are actually applicable. But if you're really honest about this, it's not such a big train smash because everything we do is about beauty, isn't it? Even the application, when I'm confirming that the application actually works, if I really, uh, unpack, eventually I'm, I'm relying on my instinct that it actually, I, I feel it like it works. It's some kind of instinct of beauty as well. What is different from between mathematics and other things is, is the emphasis on reasoning. So the, the, uh, the subject of, of, the, of, of this thing being reasoning. Great. Now this brings two, which is a discussion. Um, the theme of this discussion is challenges in teaching and learning mathematics and sustainable development. So let me say a few words about sustainable development. Sustainable development is a concept that uh, was formalized uh, to an extent it's possible to formalize non-mathematical concepts uh, by UNESCO. We have sustainable development goals. Um, I'm not showing to you what they are here, but you can look them up. Uh, and uh, the general idea is that we want to make sure that we, we live best possible life now, but in such a way that we don't uh, eliminate possibility of, of the future generations to live such, to continue living such life. And of course, we even want to improve life for the, for the future generations. Um, so, well, first we're going to discuss a little bit what are challenges in teaching and learning mathematics, and then we, we might want to reflect on um, how would overcoming these challenges could be beneficial for, for sustainable development. And we are not going to talk about here about, about the obvious thing. The, the obvious thing is that mathematics is really, really applicable in different areas of life. And if you, if you look, go on the UNESCO webpage, talks about that. The, the, the webpage of the International Day of Mathematics talks a lot about how mathematics is useful in different areas of life. So I'm not focusing on that aspect because that's the obvious aspect we all know about. I thought we would talk about something new. So based on what we reflected in the first part, let's try to discuss uh, firstly challenges in teaching and learning mathematics. And maybe to help this discussion a little bit, I want to show you further quotes. John Wesley Young. It is clear that the chief end of mathematical study must be to make the students think. So these quotes are going to be relevant for um, teaching and learning mathematics. 
Georg Cantor says, in mathematics, the art of proposing a question must be held of higher value than solving it. William Paul Thurston says, mathematics is not about numbers, equations, computations, or algorithms. It is about understanding. Shaikuntala Devi says, why do children dread mathematics? Because of the wrong approach, because it is looked at as a subject. This is a very interesting quote. I, one would have to think a little bit what it means, right? Paul Halmos says, the only way to learn mathematics is to do mathematics. So at this point, I would like to open the uh, floor for a discussion. Also, for, for our online participants, please uh, raise your hand and uh, um, express your views. Or uh, if you want to criticize what I said before, feel free to do that. Criticism is a very important tool in mathematics. We, we criticize a lot of things we do, and then we learn from, from that. Sometimes we even criticize each other, and then we get upset with each other, and that's not very good. <laughs> but um, even, even from that experience, we learn. So what do you think are the challenges in teaching and learning mathematics if you're a student? You might want to talk to us about the challenges in, in learning mathematics. If you're a teacher or lecturer, you might want to say a few words about challenges in teaching mathematics. Can I just ask a question to the mathematicians in the room here in Zurab? So when we're speaking about mathematics in a South African education context, I'm thinking of numeracy. And when I went into second year mathematics at university, it became a completely different subject. So for the mathematicians in the room, whether you regard numeracy as mathematics, is that a, I would almost put a dotted line in between those two things. This is a very good question. Any mathematician in the room who wants to answer the question? Personally, yes, 100%. And um, it's part numeracy, it's part of maths. And just the background there, like I was once sort of an arrogant mathematician and thought that since I'm a university lecturer, I'm in charge of the definition of mathematics. But then at some point, I realized that um, no one group of people is in charge of the definition of mathematics and uh, school teachers and other role players have just as much right to define the word as university lecturers and so what they regard as mathematics at school is is mathematics as well full stop in my opinion thank you very much Bruce we have another um, question, comment, or answer. Maybe a bit of a comment, but what I find is that a lot of students approach mathematics in a very algorithmic approach. So have a set way of approaching a set problem. And that is a problem. <laughs> so I want to link up these two comments to the quotes we have on the screen. Um, you you asked what um numeracy is not and we have a code here that says mathematics is not about numbers equations computations or algorithms it's about understanding but then bruce told us that actually paul uh william thurston uh shouldn't be so arrogant to think <laughs> up the definition of mathematics but the truth is that none of these quotes are meant to be definitions they're meant to emphasize and so when you're doing numeracy, understanding is important there. And if you take away understanding from numeracy, then maybe it's less of a mathematics than it would be if you're un understanding what you're doing. Um, and uh, the other comment about algorithmic um, learning, um, it also relates to this quote, but then it relates to, um, students thinking well um what is algorithmic um, learning i mean algorithms are very useful things we've developed two algorithms today one is how to compute the 
the VAT free cost. And the other one is uh, this crazy thing about entities being related to themselves or not. These are algorithms. You can now apply this. But now when you're learning mathematics um, and all you do is to learn about these algorithms, you never get to be shown or experience how to uh, develop one yourself. And maybe that's where it, it starts to miss the point. But algorithms are very important. We all, uh, a mathematician is overjoyed when he discovers an algorithm he can use um, in the future. Any other um, inputs maybe from the online audience or um, from here? Maybe let's give a chance to the online audience um, first. So there's a question from Fabrice. The question is, can we choose or find a world where the assumption doesn't apply to Jack, but it does for the others? Yes, we can. For Jack, we had minimal assumptions. We, in the most, most general case, it was just an entity. We didn't really have any assumptions on Jack. But usually we can do all sorts of things like that. I'm sorry, the answer is a bit brief, but if a person wants to engage in further technical detail about this problem, please email me and I'll be happy to. Just on the, as you were mentioning, the challenges of learning or teaching mathematics, I think from my personal experience, it's very rare to find a mathematical setting where you are te learning mathematics and it's not in that very standardized and very algorithmic way of learning methods and proofs and all that stuff. Whereas I've heard of some people who have had experiences with mathematics and the beauty of that and have found passion in that, but it's very, especially in high school and early university, it's delineated into something that's more on a either artistic or otherwise it's just algorithms. And then people don't get exposed unless they actively look for it. And so I think a challenge might lie there where the messaging behind mathematics, like the public image is very distorted. I think, like you said, it's a very playful and a very kind of experimental thing where one can go out and discover their own ideas about the world using mathematics. But I don't think people get exposed to that as often as they should. Thank you very much. Um, you see, what he told us is exactly what I wrote in my next slide. We can still come back to the discussion, but I want to show my slides so that we don't, um, we don't miss this magic trick that I could predict what he told us. Overcoming the barriers to embracing mathematics and its emergence, subject, and essence, um, the, these challenges are these barriers. Um, and then we, we can come back to the, um, to the effect on sustainable development. Let's go back to, uh, to this discussion. Any other inputs? Um, I think possibly the big, one of the biggest challenges would be teaching mathematics in a way that allows a person to seek the definition that they have on it. Like if we leave maths far too abstract, um, then somebody who maybe is interested in engineers in engineering or in something more physical might start to get irritated and that they can't see what they can do with it. But then when you make things too... Um, applicable and to based on tangibles then someone who wants to do something more abstract like topology or category theory then they start to lose interest so uh maybe the, 
a challenge lies in teaching it in a way that has less of a definition, maybe. Thank you very much. I, I think um, none of the quotes that are written up there match uh, with what you're saying. Uh, basically, you're saying that people have different tastes. When you um, talk to a group of people of, of diverse tastes, it's difficult to um, cater for all at once. Um, perhaps it's a subject of further discussion whether that actually is one of the challenges or not. Um, I, in, in my own teaching experience, um, I haven't like really so much experienced that challenge because I, I kind of try to um, take out the questions. So following your Cantor's suggestion there, so um, I, I let the students ask the questions and then we explore them. And then it doesn't matter whether you're interested in applications or the theory. If you ask a question and it gets discussed in class, you find a value class. Any other um, inputs? Um, hello. I would just like to relate to the, um, I saw the next slide said raising the quality of education. And um, you know, I think that's something that also needs a lot of work if we want to encourage like every individual to be able to like mathematics or like approach it because at the moment uh, like I feel in high school and university um, going to math is more like a survival tactic it's not like doing it because you actually like it or want to understand it it's just to survive and make your parents proud or like just now you're going to be secure, end up secure somewhere. Thank you very much for that contribution. I think it links up nicely with what Shakuntala Devi told us, that it's looked at as a subject. So it is a big challenge because after all, you need those marks to get into the university and then you need those marks at the university to graduate. Um, now, we're not talking today what the solutions to these problems are. Really. The, the point of this discussion is to identify what the challenges are. But wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have these challenges? Wouldn't it be nice if getting good results and showing off to your parents and getting uh, prestigious degrees and so on was aligned with uh, finding the, the passion in the subject and, and its true essence? Uh, Erna Lampen, could you please ask the question? Good afternoon. I want to make a comment, please. Yes, please. I, I am teaching mathematics education at Stellenbosch University. And um, my experience of teaching mathematics in a way that makes sense, that, that celebrates the power of the human mind, came from work that was done at Stellenbosch University in the late 1980s, 1990s and on, where in a research project called Problem-Centered Mathematics, where ordinary children in ordinary schools did mathematics in a way that allowed them to use their reasoning to structure numbers and relationships between operations and numbers in a very natural way in a way that international research Hans Freudenthal would call reinventing mathematics. I think the problem today is the same as it has always been. And perhaps it relates to um, the fact that it's looked at as a subject where people tend to think um, you have to know the basics before you can start thinking. And that is killing our subject from grade one. One can think while you develop the basics. I want to give a simple example. Instead of having children chanting one and one is two, 
one and two is three and so forth. Why not give a series of um, equivalences and ask them to look at, to predict what would come next? If one and one is two and one and two is three, what do you think is one and four? What do you think is one and five and have discussions? So just a simple example. The other huge problem lies in the psychology of um, education where we have a pyramidal form that says basic knowledge is first, then comes application, then comes reasoning. Uh, it's called Bloom's taxonomy. That taxonomy, which is an useful perhaps for assessment of what somebody is doing, is wrongly applied as a theory for learning steps. That means we never get to the higher order reasoning parts. We keep at the level of facts that must be remembered. And sadly, the human mind doesn't work that way. I say to my students, you can, learn, you can teach a monkey to type, which they do, with enough patience and feeding the monkey enough. You cannot do that to a human. It's wonderful that children give up on mathematics if they are forced to just remember uh, things that they are told. It means they are still human. Humans want to understand and want to create from the moment they're born, not one day when they know enough facts. Thank you very much, um, Erna, for this wonderful contribution. It reminds me um, a document you can find online. It's Albert Einstein's address at one of the occasions where he was invited to address a, a certain university audience where he emphasizes this um, opposition between building basic knowledge and exploring and thinking. I really recommend everyone to, to look up. Um, you can just search in Google Albert Einstein on education, and you will find their sentiments that are very close to what they're um, Now, I would like to move on. Um, the next uh, thing I want to say here is that if we, if we are able to overcome these challenges um, and change the relationship towards mathematics as something that's, that's friendly, then it would impact uh, uh, in an indirect way several of the sustainability um, goals because sustainable development goals because indeed mathematics is about reasoning and you need to think and reason uh, in a harmonious way to make progress in different areas of life. Um, now, another thing today is uh, the theme for today's uh, uh, International Day of Mathematics, which is mathematics for everyone. This is another topic for discussion. We are not going to enter deeply into the topic. I just want to make two points that are based on these two quotations. Firstly, David e. Hilbert said something that may be now quite obvious today, but might not have been so obvious when he said that, unfortunately. Mathematics knows no races or geographic boundaries. For mathematics, the cultural world is one country. The other quote is by Carl Friedrich Gauss. He says, if others would but reflect on mathematical truths as deeply and continuously as I have, they would make my discoveries. Now, this quote ties very well with the theme mathematics for everyone. Why? Because Gauss, which is regarded as one of the best mathematicians of all time. So there is a common consensus among at least pure mathematicians that Gauss was, if not the best, then one of the best mathematicians of all time. He's telling us that everything he did, anyone else can do. You only just need to reflect on mathematical truths as deeply and continuously as he has done. So engage in that world of the mind where you follow uh, the emergence uh, subject and the essence. So is it really true? Is it really so? Don't human, human beings have talents? You're 
You might be good at figure skating or you might be good at singing. Isn't such a thing as being good at mathematics naturally? Well, of course, being good at something gives you an advantage in the beginning. But the spirit is that with hard work and perseverance, you can still get there. And this is one of uh, the, is someone who is considered to be one of the best messengers of all time telling us. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sura. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we had already many questions and uh, interventions from the online and, and, and the real audience. Um, so I think uh, it's my pleasant duty to, to invite you outside where there should be a little reception so that we can all celebrate together the International Day of Mathematics. Yeah. So thank you very much, Surab, again. It was really very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you.